Hello, everybody, again, and welcome to the 10th recap webinar. Today's webinar is entitled A Capitalism for the People. Our speaker is Professor Luigi Zingales from the Booth School of Business, University of Chicago. Luigi also is the director of the Stigler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State and the fellow of the NBR, the CEPR, and the European Governance Institute. He also served on the board of ProMarket, and he's the co-host of the podcast Capitalism. In 2014, he was the president of the American Finance Association. Luigi Zingales' research interests span from corporate governance to financial development, from political economy to the economic effects of culture. His research has earned him the 2003 Bernaser Prize for the best young European financial economist. His work has been published in the major economic and finance journal. He co-developed the Financial Trust Index. He's the author of the two bestsellers, Saving Capitalism from Capitalists and the Capitalism for the People, Recapturing the Lost Genius of American Prosperity. Today, Luigi will tell us about the capitalism being able to rewind the hearts and the minds of the new generation of Americans. Current capitalism has created a lot of disappointment it has failed to deliver for all and has generated a lot of inequality. The way ahead towards a true capitalism for the people will surely require promoting competition over the protection of property rights. Without further ado, Luigi, the floor is yours. So thank you, Claudio, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Um, these are extraordinary times and uh, I'm gonna disappoint many of you because I'm not gonna talk directly about these extraordinary times. I'm, I'm happy in the Q&A session to take uh, question and answers uh, about uh, the impact of the war, the impact of the pandemic, the impact of all these events that are really uh, changing the world. Um, however, what I want to discuss today is uh, how much the world was already changing before. And as I maybe will, will mention in due course is how this, uh, uh, tragic events from the pandemic to the war uh, will only have the effect to, to some extent of exacerbating and accelerating some of the trends that uh, were present even before uh, the pandemic and the war. So if you look at the world in, uh, at the beginning of 2020 and particularly uh, the United States by the war, you could on, uh, on one hand say that this was uh, the best of times. Uh, why? Because uh, the, the West, and but not only the West, the world at large, uh, has experienced in the last uh, 150 years, unprecedented growth. Um, and uh, the most remarkable fact is that this growth has not been uh, only making countries like uh, uh, the United States and the Western country rich, but more broadly as spread uh, around the world. This is a, uh, a, a very interesting picture of uh, the relation between GDP per capita in 1960 and uh, GDP per capita in 2014. And as you can see, except a few uh, states, a uh, few countries, uh, most of, uh, of which are basically devastated by wars, uh, everybody is above the 45 degree line. So everybody is uh, better off in 2014 in real terms per capita, uh, than they were in 1960, and many of them much better than they were before. And this is not just an average statement, is the property uh, people in, uh, sorry, the poverty, the people in poverty uh, have been reduced, been reducing in number, in spite of the fact that uh, the um, number of people in the world uh, has increased quite dramatically. So uh, it seems that the, uh, this is really a remarkable success uh, of capitalism. And uh, if you look around, uh, one of the best indicators of uh, how well people are doing is how long they live. And what is remarkable is if you look in 1950 and in 2015, you see that uh, the life expectancy has increased dramatically. But what is even more remarkable, if you want, is that uh, in most of the poorest country on earth today, the life expectancy is basically what it was in Western Europe in the 1950s. 
So there has been like a, a quite dramatic catch up, at least in terms of life expectancy, and has been generalized a benefit in, in basically the entire world. And uh, it, I don't know how much you like this statistic, but uh, if you measure sort of uh, billionaires in real terms in the United States, uh, you have seen an explosion, an unprecedented explosion in the number of billionaires per uh, 10 million inhabitants. Uh, you need to normalize by a large number because of course the billionaires are few. But if you think about this, in the what was called the Gilded Age, uh, there were only uh, three billionaires per 10 million, 10 million people in the United States. Now we are approaching 20. Uh, per 10 million people. So uh, there seem to be uh, never easier as being to become a billionaire, which doesn't mean it's easy, but it's never easier. So why there is this generalized discontent even before the pandemic, even before the war? Um, and this is where there are a lot of uh, indications and I'm gonna focus here mainly in indication in the United States I would make some reference to Europe or maybe to Italy, but I think that uh, this is mostly a, a US-focused uh, talk. And uh, the first uh, quite dramatic uh, indicator that is negative is the decline in social mobility. This is a famous piece by Chetty and Al that looks at uh, what is the probability that somebody born in a certain year, let's say 1940, uh, will earn more than um, his father. Uh, this is not uh, only because we're uh, actually we're not trying to be male oriented, but it is more comparable because actually most of the mothers make more today because they weren't working before. But uh, so we're looking at, at uh, uh, male population. And basically you're saying that uh, in the 19, if you were born in the 1940s, uh, short of being uh, the child of Rockefeller, that was difficult to earn more than your father, you were earning more than your father. And uh, if you were born in 1980, you have 50-50 chances of making more than your father. And uh, this is a, a, a data that requires a, a few years to process. So uh, the, the younger generation, the millennial generation are not here in the picture yet. But uh, if this trend continues, uh, it means that uh, the majority of millennial are not gonna be able to be as which as their parents. And this is difficult for any uh, society, but it's particularly difficult for a society like the United States that made mobility uh, the myth of uh, the place. The, the, the narrative was this is the country from rag to riches. This is the country of the frontier where anybody can become rich. And, uh, and while, as I just showed you, some people become really, really rich, I think that uh, uh, the vast majority of people cannot even become as rich as their parents. And if this is true on average, is true actually even more so for people without a college degree. This is a, a picture taken from the latest uh, book by uh, Case and Deaton. And uh, what you see is uh, each of this curve is a different cohort. And uh, the lower, courts, uh, lower curves are courts that were born, uh, sorry, that I don't uh, have a bachelor degree, so an undergraduate degree, and the upper one, the one with the undergraduate degree. And what you see is, uh, first of all, a flattening out of the, of the curve for people without an undergraduate. Now, remember that the vast majority of people in the United States still don't have an undergraduate degree. And so the vast majority of people in the United States saw their real wage basically flattening out. And uh, actually, uh, the more so the younger uh, the generations are. Uh, so you see that uh, uh, if you look at... Uh, uh, the 1940 gap between here and here was not as big. The 1980 gap is already expanding much larger. And then you see progressing over time as you age. So uh, it, basically, if you don't have a college degree in the United States, the uh, 
uh, myth of uh, the land of opportunities is uh, shatter, it's not, it's not for you. And in case this is not enough, and these are data before uh, the, uh, the pandemic, so they're not affected by, uh, by COVID. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the um, death per 100,000, which is a, a measure of uh, 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 mortality and the opposite, of course, of life expectancy, you see that uh, death per 100,000 has been dropping constantly for all the Western countries. And there is only one exception, and the, yeah, the, the exception is white males, mostly males, but white uh, uh, people in the United States. Okay, you see that mortality has gone up, and, and this is uh, the so called uh, uh, pandemic of despair that is a combination of uh, opioid, suicide, and alcohol. Okay. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this uh, uh, pandemic is particularly concentrated among people without a college degree. And uh, so it's not that surprising that you see a lot of pervasive pessimism. This is the number of people who think that uh, uh, their children will be better than uh, the, 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 the future of their children will be better than their own. And now, um, if you are Italian, you're not surprised to see that 61% think that uh, uh, the future is going to be worse off. And that's not that surprising because Italy did not grow uh, in the last 25 years. But uh, I think that uh, uh, in, real, in real terms per capita, I should say, but this is true also in the United States, 57% of the people think that uh, uh, actually their children are not going to be better off. And they seem to be roughly right because the, the statistic I show you by Chetty before seem to suggest that this is indeed the case. And one of the most uh, remarkable fact is that if you look at uh, a, a survey in which they ask Americans, would you prefer to live in a socialist country? Uh, you see that uh, a majority of women in the below 34 uh, want, would like to live in a socialist country. Now, it's interesting because it's not obvious uh, what experience and cognition uh, American women below 35 have of a socialist country. They don't have a lot of models, but what, what it is saying is that the younger generation, and this is true also for males, but in less, less proportion, but the younger generation seems to prefer a uh, socialist country uh, to uh, the United States. And if you live in Europe, that's not that surprising. Uh, when I was a kid in Italy, uh, we are the largest communist country in the, in, in, the, in the world outside the Soviet bloc. So I think that uh, uh, being socialist was uh, trendy, was, uh, was dominant. But uh, in, uh, in the United States, socialist has always been a kind of uh, almost an, an insult, something that uh, you uh, label to disqualify an opponent. And the fact that uh, there is so much uh, consensus for a model that is not that clear to begin with is an indication that somehow uh, capitalism is losing uh, the hearts and mind and is losing the hearts and mind uh, for a number of reasons. And so what I wanna focus today is trying to understand why is capitalism not working for everyone? And of course, what we can do about it. And um, when I say why, I will focus on uh, four uh, different uh, reasons. One uh, which is uh, well understood, uh, uh, but important is what I call the superstar economy. Uh, the second is the characteristic of the intangible economy. The third is how digital platforms are uh, making things worse. And then uh, in a, another element, which is not sufficiently emphasized, but I think is, is quite important that what I call elite economy. And unfortunately, all these three things go in the same direction, go in the direction of making capitalism uh, beneficial to um, few at the expense of the many. So uh, let me start with uh, uh, the superstar economy. Now, the superstar economy is not a new idea. In fact, uh, a, a, a late colleague here in Chicago, Shervin Rosen, who unfortunately died prematurely, otherwise I think he would have won the Nobel Prize, 
um, in 1981, so long before globalization uh, changed the world, uh, make the point that uh, there are situations in which uh, a combination of taste and technology makes uh, uh, the economy reward a few superstars. So what are these conditions? One is there is imperfect substitution. So if uh, I need brain surgery, I want a best uh, uh, surgeon. And uh, if a surgeon is 10% more successful in saving lives, um, people are willing to pay much more than 10% premium to have it. If I risk going to jail, I want the best lawyer. And uh, a lawyer that is 10% better is much more desirable than 10% uh, more. Uh, and I can keep going, but uh, as you can see, if I play soccer, uh, if I am 10% better, I'm paying more than 10% more and so on and so forth. And this imperfect substitution combined with uh, technology where the, co the marginal cost of serving an extra customers tend to be zero, uh, lead to a superstar economy. So if I'm a performer or an author of the book, I put the same effort, whether there are a hundred or a thousand or a million people. Uh, think about this lecture. There are now 150 participants, but uh, could easily scale to a thousand or 10,000. My effort will not be different. Uh, and I will get uh, a much higher reward by spreading this over a larger group of people. So the combination of one and two uh, is such that more talented people will command a disproportionate larger income. Let me make this example with golf. Uh, I, I know nothing about golf and I refuse to play it. So, uh, but uh, in the United States is much more pop popular than soccer. And so uh, when I make this uh, uh, case in the United States, it's easier to make it uh, uh, with, with golf than with soccer. But had I made it with soccer, it would have been exactly the same thing. And it says, uh, when I grew up in Italy, Gigi Riva was a, a, the key player. Uh, Gigi Riva's salary comparison to the one of Ronaldo is nothing, even adjusted for inflation, real term, and whatever, whatever. So here I did uh, something for golf. and. Um, the, the major prize in golf is the Augusta Master Tournament. And um, it's very easy actually to get the prices uh, that uh, are offered for the Augusta Master Tournament. And not only the first, but the various prices. And I, to put it in context, I put a, uh, the, uh, what I call the annual salary of a greenkeeper, uh, which is basically, I use the minimum wage in the United States. And uh, what you see is not only that started in the 80s and more so in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, the prices have skyrocketed in real terms, okay? They were not very remarkable in the 50s and 60s, but they have exploded in the last uh, three decades. But also notice that there is a disproportionate increase uh, between the various prices. So, um, the 45th price has not increased very much. The fifth price has increased a bit, but the difference between the first and the fifth price has skyrocketed. And that's exactly what uh, the superstar economy is about and is a disproportional return to a few winners. And uh, part of what globalization has done has made uh, the winners, global winners, creating a disproportional return. So when I was a kid in Italy, only Italians were watching Gigi Riva. And today, everybody from China to Latin America is watching uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. And, uh, and so I think that uh, if you are the best player in that generation, you now can command uh, a return. And this is, by the way, just a return on, on the prices if you were to look at advertising, and I think I have a number from advertising, is even worse, is disproportionate going to uh, the top players. Um, then let's look at the, the second fact. If I look at the uh, US investment rates, 
you see that uh, investment in brick and mortars, and when I say brick and mortars, I'm not just saying houses, I'm saying everything that is intangible, property, plant, and equipment uh, has been declining over time. And uh, in uh, what has increased over time instead is intangible investment. And uh, this is uh, basically patents, new uh, technologies, uh, and uh, 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 software, stuff that uh, is not the traditional uh, brick and mortar. And Haskell and Westlake have a book a few years back. Uh, they say that uh, classify in a nice way what is different about intangible. And they call it the four S's. Uh, and they are scalability, sunkness, spillovers, and synergies. Scalability is what I already discussed is that uh, uh, when I am Zooming, I can easily give a seminar to 119 people or 1,119 uh, or uh, whatever, 1 million, and you can make it easily. So um, this is basically at no extra cost. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, Zoom charges, actually, I know that uh, Zoom charges a subcharge uh, for uh, a special charge if you have a higher number of people, but that's just a way in which they price stuff to uh, increase uh, uh, their revenues. But de facto, uh, you can scale it. Uh, uh, the, the cost of scaling is uh, really, technological cost is close to zero. Uh, the second is uh, the sunkness. When I invented uh, the, oh, not I, but the person who invented the Zoom algorithm, uh, that cost is sunk and the marginal cost of using is close to zero. Um, and then uh, the spillovers are stronger for intangible investment because I can more easily learn and I can easily learn without uh, uh, taking away from the people that give. Uh, if I learn uh, from you how to uh, use a software, is not that your ability to use the software is reduced, it's just I learn and I can uh, uh, use more effectively. And so you using the latest software makes me learn the latest software more easily. And then of course, there are uh, a lot of uh, synergies in uh, we couldn't really uh, use Zoom if we didn't have a, a very uh, elaborate system of, for example, uh, internet and uh, uh, a way to uh, locate the address on the internet and so on and so forth. So um, all these things uh, go together in the direction of uh, leading a disproportionate return on the top. Uh, at the end of the day, there are a lot of uh, way to communicate like we're doing now uh, via Zoom. Uh, there is a Microsoft product, there is a Google product, uh, they, there, are, uh, there is a Cisco product. Um, however, uh, the immediate success of Zoom has made Zoom the standard and uh, has given a disproportionate return to one. So it's not necessarily that uh, the investment of Zoom has been dramatically higher than the investment that others put into it, but uh, for a number of reasons became the standard. And when it became a standard, I think that uh, the return was disproportionate. And this brings uh, the role of platform economy very much in, into place. Why? Uh, so let's first define a platform is a firm uh, that has two distinct user groups that provide each other some network benefits. So, uh, Platforms are not recent. Uh, credit cards have been around since the, the 60s and the credit cards are a typical example of a platform. Why? Because I uh, carry a particular credit card because I think that a lot of merchants will carry that card and merchants will carry that card because they think a lot of customers will have the card. And so as a customer, when I join a, a credit card company, uh, as a customer, I provide a benefit to the merchants and vice versa when the merchants provide a benefit to, to the customers. So platforms have existed for a long time. 
Um, and uh, think about it, the old fashioned newspapers were platforms where uh, the major source of the benefits was actually the classify ads. Uh, and then you have uh, the readers and you have the journalists. And, and so those are, are a multi-sided platform. Um, but uh, in digital form, their number has increased uh, uh, tremendously. And uh, for a coincidence of a factor that again, alone were present before, but uh, they've never been encountered to the same level. So one is this uh, network effect. So uh, the, there is a network effect in classify ads, but uh, geography used to limit that. Uh, and so uh, the reason why uh, in the United States, particularly, uh, there was a Chicago Tribune, there was a New York Times, there was a Los Angeles Times, is because the classify ads in New York are useless in Chicago and vice versa. Okay. Uh, today, now classify ads have been taken over by Craigslist, but today uh, uh, there is no this limitation because I can buy, uh, now there's still transportation costs for a bike, but I can buy many products uh, from people in New York uh, and uh, people in New York and buy many products people in Chicago. And so uh, that uh, the network tonight has increased geographically tremendously. Uh, then there are very strong economies of scale due to the data. So uh, the success of companies that provide a lot of stuff for free, like Facebook or Google, um, is due to the fact that they don't provide the stuff for free, but they provide in exchange for uh, in-kind uh, good called our data. And uh, our data uh, are very useful, but uh, they are more useful the more data this platform have, because if I can cross-reference my data on consumption with my data of searches and my data on health, uh, then uh, this becomes much more valuable because I can uh, predict uh, uh, what type of uh, product you, you wanna uh, buy based on what you search and your state of mind and your health. And so uh, this gives an enormous uh, economies of scale. Um, and so economies of scope. Um, in uh, today, uh, the platforms are entering a lot of businesses that uh, were not there before uh, or were before done by other companies. So uh, Amazon started as a book retailer, um, but now is present uh, in uh, not only in grocery, and in electronics and in pharmacy, uh, but in uh, basically everything you can think of, including, by the way, financing. Uh, and of course, adding the data, I can give you financing at a better rate or more uh, targeted than uh, any other players. And, uh, and that's true, by the way, of Alibaba too. Uh, the fourth thing is uh, the low marginal cost. Um, if I had a better business model in the past, it took forever, forever maybe is too much, but it took decades to expand this business model uh, even within a country, let alone within the world. So think about Starbucks. Starbucks emerged in the late 80s and it took uh, a good part of 20 years to conquer the United States. Today, uh, you have a better banking system you can increase the number of customers at a speed that is unprecedented. Why? Because the marginal cost of servicing them is zero and the marginal cost of reaching them is zero. And, and so uh, we have seen banks, particularly in, uh, uh, in Korea, uh, digital banks that can conquer millions of customers in the scope of weeks. And this is something that uh, was not there before. And, and of course, I would say it is the global reach. And uh, today, uh, when you basically travel the world, unless you are in, uh, in North Korea, you end up, uh, or, or in China, because there is the great uh, uh, wall of China that protects the internet, but you end up, uh, uh, using Facebook, using Google, using Amazon, uh, using basically the same 
uh, stuff everywhere in the world, uh, giving an extraordinarily disproportionate return to uh, uh, the first entrant. And uh, last but not least, uh, there is uh, this system of an elite economy. Uh, so there is the disproportionate return at the top for the three reasons I described earlier, lead to high income inequality. And uh, because the return at the top is often the results of uh, feds or this natural ability to exploit the synergies or by focal points, uh, there is a lot of persistence on who is at the top. So uh, was Facebook really, really so much better than MySpace? Not obvious, uh, but Facebook is a company worth a trillion dollar, actually it was worth a trillion dollar a few uh, weeks ago, but now it's dropped a lot. But anyway, worth in that order of magnitude, you know, MySpace is worth nothing. And, uh, and it, before we can... Uh, uh, displays Facebook from that role is taking a lot, a lot of time. So there is a lot of persistence who is at the top that leads to a, a lack of mobility, the lack of mobility that we started to see in the Chetty data. But I suspect when Chetty will redo the analysis for the more recent years, the problem will be even more severe. And then there is the sense of the formation of a stable elite that is separate from the people falling behind that are affected by economic despair. So uh, in the old days, um, if I went to college, I had a better standard of living, but uh, not so much better that will put my kids into a, a realm that was difficult for the other guys to catch up. And that what uh, led to mobility. Today, the high income inequality is such that uh, my kids are probably in a position that uh, makes them very difficult to fall behind. And uh, the flip side of that is that uh, the people who are falling behind uh, don't have a chance to succeed. And uh, one of the biggest scandals of the university admission in the United States is the amount of uh, legacy admission. Uh, informally, you don't find this data officially, but informally, the rumor that you hear is that Harvard has a policy of a third, a third, a third. A third are uh, legacy admissions, so kids of people who went to Harvard. Uh, a third is made of affirmative action and athletes. And a third is made of people who deserves it. So uh, if you are a white known legacy, you have trivial chances in getting into Harvard. You have uh, one third of the chances that uh, of the other group. And because your group is much larger numerically, I had not done the calculation, but your chances is really uh, jeopardized in a major way. And so in addition to that, the elite, it tends to dominate the political scene, extractly political benefits for itself. So the irony of this, and you see this in this moment in the United States, there is a huge lobby to uh, forgive $10,000 of student loans to uh, 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 former students. And you say, wait a minute, didn't we see that uh, the students, the one with a college degree are the one that benefit the most? Why do we have to subsidize the people who are gonna be much better in life? If we wanna spend $10,000 per person, why don't we give it to the people who really need, the people that are falling behind? Um, the problem is that the people who are falling behind are not particularly well represented in Washington and even less so in, in, in the media, and even less so in the social media. And so there is an enormous amount of pressure uh, into the Biden administration to forgive student loans uh, to the benefits of the very elite. And so what we are going to are seeing is what I call the Medici vicious circle. Uh, after the, of course, the Florentine family of the Medici, 
the Medici made their money uh, through banking. And from what I understand historically, pretty legitimately, they were skillful in making their money. But then, unlike many other bankers in Florence, they maintained their money, not remaining in banking. Who remained in banking uh, lost most of their money. They actually conquered the political power in the city of Florence and used the political power to get more money that will maintain their political power. So uh, money give you power and power give you money. And that is very difficult to break uh, as uh, the Medici example shows, given that uh, the Medici ruled the city of Florence in one way or another, roughly three centuries. So given this pretty desperate situation, what can we do? And this is where I want to distinguish between what I call two type of uh, capitalism, uh, what I label conservative capitalism versus popular capitalism. And maybe the term conservative is unfair because it's conservative with a little c and not a capital C. Here is a capital C because it's the beginning of the sentence, but uh, is, a, is, is a, in a way of conserving what is there. So conservative capitalists tend to emphasize the protection of property rights above and behind everything else. And now, don't take me wrong, protection of property rights is an important component of any form of capitalism. However, the question is, how much do you want to push that? And uh, imagine a world in which the inventor of the alphabet had the right to a royalty every time we use one letter in the alphabet. And the inventor of each word had the right to a royalty every time he used that word. Now, communication will be impaired and let alone commerce. You know, the word Rinascente was invented by Danunzio. Uh, so do we have to pay a royalty to the family uh, of Danunzio every time we use the word Rinascente, even outside of uh, the, the store? Um, and so on and so forth. This is, now it seems crazy, but it's not that crazy because today we pay a royalty every time we have a picture of Mickey Mouse. And Mickey Mouse at this point has been invented uh, roughly a hundred years ago. Um, in uh, uh, Walt Disney has been dead for uh, more than 50 years. And so how can you possibly still protect this if not to uh, benefit the few at the expense of the many. And so the difference is that popular capitalists emphasize competition, okay? And, uh, and uh, to the extreme that is willing to redefine some property rights to promote competition. Now, this is a very delicate sense of because uh, property rights in many people view are sacrosanct. And uh, I respect and I think are important to respect property rights. But let me make an example that uh, resonates to all of you. And probably most of you are young and don't even remember a time where uh, the local phone provider in Italia, what used to be uh, La SIP and Telecom, now team, own uh, your phone number. Now, you give for granted that you own the phone number and you can move uh, and change the phone company, uh, retaining your phone number. Now, why you own it? Because honestly, you did not create it. And uh, if you led it to the free market competition, I think that uh, uh, Telecom Italia or now team would be delighted to maintain ownership of that phone number. So there was a regulation uh, that uh, is called number portability that forces companies to relinquish their phone numbers to their customers. And why this was invented? Because only if you can bring your phone number with you, you're not locked in. And if you were locked in, this will reduce competition to attract customers. Reducing competition will, uh, will create huge trends for phone companies, but will not be efficient from a global point of view. On the other hand, if you own it, companies can more easily compete for you and you have better service at lower prices. And, and I have a, a study with a co-author looking across a lot of countries where we find that the introduction of number portability leads to lower prices, lower profit margin, 
But if anything, better quality, no less investment, no lower wages. So this is saying customers are better off and uh, you don't see a decline in quality. The only one that is not better off are the people owning uh, telecom shares. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, true in, in a lot of cases. I don't have the picture here, but uh, you know, um, uh, Carlos Slim uh, used to be the richest man on earth. And uh, when he lost this uh, primacy uh, in 2015, 16, because uh, uh, they deregulated or re-regulated the market of telecommunication in Mexico. And so they introduced more competition in Mexico and um, the value of his wealth uh, shrunk by 30 billion. Now don't cry for him because he had 40 billion left. So he's not exactly uh, a, a poor person, but is he was making money through monopoly. And once you bring competition, you make uh, uh, hundreds of millions of Mexicans better off at the cost of uh, his reduced wealth. So it's not technically a Pareto improvement uh, because one person is worse off, but it's hard to argue that in, uh, we wanna defend a system that uh, concentrates so much wealth into one person uh, at the expense of uh, everybody else. Now, the phone number portability is actually a, a concept that can be applied to a lot of other places. I am still a client of City, City Group uh, 20 years later, uh, and uh, I hate City Group. And uh, the reason why I don't change is because I'm lazy and uh, with wire transfer coming in and coming out, it's too complicated and I prefer not to do it. However, if I could have the portability of my bank account, I would do it tomorrow. Uh, and uh, you, why you cannot transfer uh, the bank account as easily as you can transfer and cheaply as you can transfer a cell phone number. Now, in Europe uh, and in, in the UK, uh, legislation has come in this sense. The open banking law in the UK and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the data directive in the, in the uh, EU has basically created uh, uh, the conditions to have this. And so we hope that uh, pretty soon this competition will come in, in Europe, but it's not there in the United States, no, anybody's planning to introduce it. And uh, the same story could be with the social graph portability. Today, uh, if I move from Facebook to another social media, I cannot uh, bring my social graph with it. So what are my contacts, my information, so why I cannot automatically send to uh, all my uh, uh, Twitter follower what I get from LinkedIn and vice versa and integrate with Facebook. This is all done to create bias to competition. So uh, social graph portability and interoperability are a way to reduce some of those distortions that bring all the benefits to the top. And those distortions are uh, a part of the network externalities and uh, of the economies of scale and scope. And uh, in many cases, you have to force this interoperability. Uh, so today, we don't uh, uh, think twice in the United States or in Italy or in Europe, if I can call somebody that uh, uh, has his phone service services uh, with somebody else. So if I am in Italy and I'm using team and I call somebody with Vodafone or with wind, um, that's somebody else's problem. I know that I can reach them, uh, no problem. And I can reach them, no problem, not because team and wind and Vodafone nicely collaborated, no, it's because a law forces interoperability. And this is an idea that came in the, in the early 20s in the United States when the phone started to develop. Uh, there were independent phone loops. 
And, uh, and of course, there were enormous externalities because I want to have a phone to call my kids. And uh, so I want to have the same uh, phone company as my kids if that's the only way to reach them. And that creates enormous network externalities. But these network externalities can be broken by forcing interoperability. And even in the internet, there is a very interesting case that I recommend everybody to uh, look at. And in particular, you can find a, a, a podcast from uh, NPR Planet Money that described this case very uh, eloquently. This is a case of a little venture that um, uh, was created in uh, the early, I think, 2008 uh, to uh, interopera uh, make interoperable various uh, social media. So um, wouldn't it be nice to have one interface where I can post my picture that I want to post on Facebook on all the social media I own and that uh, gets the feed from all the social media and select to my taste the information I want to have. So I follow uh, some people on Twitter. I hate when people talk on Twitter about soccer, okay? Why is not because I don't care about soccer is because when I'm looking at Twitter, I'm looking for news, I'm looking for economic news. I don't wanna be distracted by other stuff. So if I could have my own filter of, I get the Twitter news from my friends, but I filter the stuff I don't like, I will do it tomorrow. And Power Venture was doing that more than 10 years ago. Now, Power Venture was brought uh, to bankruptcy by Facebook through a legal suit that seemed preposterous but prevail. The legal suit is that if I give Claudio my login and password of Facebook and Claudio with my permission gets into my Facebook account and gets some data from my Facebook account, Claudio commits a federal crime in the United States called hacking, can go to jail for that. Now, the irony is that this is what Facebook did at the beginning. But as you know, uh, you know one, uh, to know one, you need to be one. And so they actually learned that to create bias to entry, they should sue the hell out of everybody who was doing what they did. And they created this bias to entry. And uh, as a result, today, social media are not interoperable. But if we have a law or regulation that forces interoperability, we allow multi-homing and multi-homing reduces the winner-take-all feature of any market. And so that's really going in the right direction. And then I think that uh, we should not be shy of forcing some functional separation. In many countries, including Italy, the electric power grid, which is a natural monopoly, is separated from the electricity production. In the same way, why we should not separate social media networking infrastructure from the editorial role. Facebook is doing two things for us. Number one is spreading our posting to everybody in the world. But second is editing, uh, is selecting which post to promote to my friends and to people outside. Those two roles do not need to be done together. And while there are gigantic networks tonight in the first activity, which is in that sense is a natural monopoly, the editorial function could benefit from competition. Now, of course, if I cross-subsidize one activity with the other, I am actually getting uh, the full power of monopoly, even in the uh, editorial activity, with extremely dangerous side effect, including on freedom. So today, uh, uh, Facebook and uh, Google decides what is legitimate, not legitimate. So they decide a certain violence is not okay, but certain others, it is. So they decided, for example, that uh, insulting Russians and uh, uh, trying to attack them or say things that are bad to them uh, is legitimate now because uh, uh, Ukraine is at war with Russia. I don't, and, uh, and so that is all of a sudden legitimate according to Facebook. Uh, Facebook is more important than, than most governments because as an impact over 3 billion people, there is no government in the world 
that has impact on 3 billion people. So I think that uh, uh, we should have this functional separation with the functional separation, we also bring uh, more uh, competition and more freedom. Now, uh, you might think that this uh, agenda is very radical. And um, I think no, exactly rediscovering what, uh, uh, since I imagine I, sp I speak to a lot of Italians here, well, I think that uh, the best president we ever had, uh, Luigi Naudi, who was an economist, wrote in 1942, and by the way, he was in Switzerland to run away from the fascist regime. And he said the legislator must intervene to level daily the trenches behind which groups of producers barricade themselves so as to acquire privileges that are harmful to other producers and to consumers. That's exactly what Facebook did. That's exactly what many businesses do today. In a sense, if you have ever studied uh, strategy in uh, any book by Porter, you know that uh, Porter teaches you how to build the trenches to protect yourself. And so if you want to have competition, you have to be a little bit more radical, as radical as Luigi Naudi was. So um, concluding, in spite uh, of its successes, capitalism is losing the hearts and minds of the new generation of Americans. It's losing them not because there is a better alternative, but because of the disappointment that the current system has created. This disappointment is real. In the 21st century, capitalism in the West has not produced a lot of wealth, but has produced a lot of inequality. And to produce a capitalism for the people, we need to focus on promoting competition over protection of property rights. And if you want to hear more about uh, my views, subscribe to my podcast, Capital Isn't, what is working about capitalism and what isn't. Thank you.